If you drive about an hour west of Calgary through the prairie and the foothills and into the Kananaskis and take a short walk from the Troll Falls parking lot through the trembling aspens and pines, you'll find Hay Meadow nestled between the Fisher Range, the Kananaskis Range, and Mount Lorette. If you're there while the sun is up and in the spring or fall, you'll also find a pair of folks with binoculars glued to their eyes and clipboards at the ready. They are the dedicated observers of one of the largest, longest running citizen science projects in the world. From sunrise to sunset, in sun or snow, they scan the skies here at the Mount Lorette site for upwards of 12 to 15 hours a day. What are they looking for? Well, hopefully you've brought your binoculars because kilometers high, what looks like tiny specks moving across the sky is actually a Golden Eagle superhighway. It's a phenomenon that was by and large unknown until 1992, and we have Desmond Allen and Peter Sherrington to thank for its discovery. I met Peter Sherrington, oh, in the late 60s or, or 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing studies of the natural areas here in Calgary, uh, leading towards getting them saved as, as natural parks. And, cool. um, later, um, after we'd done the work and got these places saved in Calgary, I was keen to um, take up some other areas. And um, the Alberta government was, um, had started a whole lot of natural, about 300 natural areas all around the province. And I applied for the one at Mount Lorette and got it mm -hmm. and uh, started the study. So Peter Sherrington um, said to me one day, well, how many species have you got? bird species and um, I was um, you know I was very proud of the fact that I had about 35 mm -hmm. and um, he said <laughs> he was really upset he said there's at least 250 in there mm -hmm. and so um, he came in to help. I was up there with my friend Des Allen and uh, we had been spending the previous year going up there at least once a, a week up to the um, Mount Lorette area uh, doing inventories of uh, plants and birds and butterflies and anything else that we could find as a, as a preparation for getting the area protected as a natural area. We were out there on the March the 20th and Peter was helping me. Um, well, not helping me, he was doing the birds for me. And uh, I heard a pine grosbeak singing so I put my binoculars up to try and see if I could see it and found it on top of a tree. And, uh, but a little dot just beyond it in the sky uh, proved to be a golden eagle. I didn't see it, Peter saw it. He said, that's a golden eagle. About a, an hour later, we looked up and we saw uh, a couple of golden eagles. We didn't think too much about it until we sat down at lunch and um, and we had lunch in the river valley there, and sitting on a log. Looked up at Mount Lorette and there were three eagles up there. This is very abnormal for resident birds. If two birds are company and three birds are feathers flying all over the place as, as one of them gets chased out. Uh, but these birds rose over Mount Lorette and uh, then they started gliding high to the northwest and out of sight. We thought, well, that's pretty interesting. So we started counting, and we saw over a hundred that day. Two days later, Peter returned to Mount Lorette and counted 250 golden eagles. And so the count was on. That fall, the first official count takes place at the Mount Lorette site. Observers record 2,043 golden eagles. Prior to this, the prevailing theory was that if there was any migration, it was short, small, four to nine pairs, and took place over the foothills. They had been looking in the wrong place, a mistake Peter did not want to repeat. And so the count began to expand to different sites. Observing the eagle's flight helped map the migration and fine tune the count. Every time we looked up there, we saw golden eagles moving at ridge level or slightly above ridge level moving to the end, soaring high over the northern end of the Fisher Range, crossing over the valley to Mount Lorette, 
soaring again and then moving off to the northwest uh, and just just following the geological trend of the of the, of the mountains and if the wind is most of the prevailing wind is coming from the southwest and it hits these ridges and the eagles like to ride just along there they sail if they can possibly do without flapping they do now designated the Rocky Mountain Eagle Research Foundation, or RMRF, and knowing that the eagles like to use the mountain ridges as a thermal-powered highway, observers begin to test different locations looking for the best place to count, for Eagle El Dorado. At the South Livingstone site, they strike gold. Here, numerous mountain ranges to the north and south all merge into one lane, the Eagle Highway. The fall 2007 count at South Livingstone totaled nearly 5,500 golden eagles and thousands of other raptors. These counts have helped turn what was a relatively unknown phenomenon into a significant source of information about golden eagles and the environments they live in. We now know their route. Many migrate up to 5,000 kilometers from the southern United States or Mexico along the Rocky Mountains up to their breeding grounds in Alaska. Their nearly eight foot wingspan makes light work of the distance as they glide at speeds of up to 100 kilometers an hour. Since other golden eagles do not migrate, the reason for the journey is not entirely clear. One theory is that the migration has occurred since the Ice Age when much of Canada and parts of the US were covered in glaciers, but Alaska remained open meaning there was vegetation and therefore hares and other prey to be found there. Nowadays, if food is plentiful and all goes according to plan, a pair will lay two eggs, only one of which is likely to survive. Examining the differences between spring and fall counts can illustrate how successful a breeding season was. Comparing those fall counts with the following spring will reveal how well the raptors fared over the winter. These insights are thanks to close to 100,000 hours of meticulously logged observations by citizen scientists. One of the remarkable things is that we have spent up to now 29 years at exactly the same site. And it could sound a little boring, just turning up at first light and standing in the same place and, and watching the world go, go by. But in fact, it's quite fascinating, and, and it's a testament to the interest in, in the results that we're finding, is that some, some of uh, our observers have been with the program. Uh, some first went up there in, in uh, the fall of 1992, uh, people like Bill, Bill Wilson and George Halmasner, and they're still out there counting. And because we are using standard protocols, we stand in the same place, we all collect the same data, we're using the same criteria uh, to, to age birds, the cumulative data set is incredibly valuable. It, it's one of the longest running continuous uh, bird surveys anywhere in North America. And it, get, it's, it gets more and more interesting because there's a context for it. If you just went out and saw one lot of birds, you say, well, that was interesting, but it would be meaningless. But the, the more you watch, the more you have a context uh, for what is happening. And this context reveals some worrying trends. We've noticed a, a serious decline, maybe up to 40% decline in the in, in, in the population since we started observing. We often suspected that uh, climate change was involved in determining the numbers and, and the dynamic. Uh, we, we, we certainly uh, quite early on realized that the birds were moving earlier in the spring. Loss of habitat in the southern wintering grounds Industrial agriculture and poaching are also likely causes of the declining numbers. In addition, extreme weather caused by climate change makes the migration increasingly treacherous. Golden eagles are an indicator species, meaning that when we study them, they can reveal our impact on the environment. This is why, 
entering its 30th year, the Rocky Mountain Eagle Research Foundation remains so important. We have envisaged this as a, as a 50 year research project. Uh, the, the, the more we count, the more interesting it becomes. And it's not just the, 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 the raw numbers, uh, but it's the, the, the ratio of immature birds to uh, adult birds, and we can correlate that to the snowshoe hair cycle. We also record um, everything that comes along, uh, including human beings that turn up at the site. They, they, they have a little slot as well. And um, we, we, we're trying to correlate the number of human beings that occur at the site with uh, ambient weather conditions. And I think it has something to do with temperature. <laughs> but we're, we're still trying to work on a mathematical model to prove that. Well, it's the most marvellous place to be, be because it's reality. And these days, reality is a very rare commodity. Uh, just, just being out there, being blown off one's feet at over with 200 kilometer an hour winds, uh, flying beautifully for several seconds and landing abominably. <laughs> um, you never know what's going to happen. It's, it's not a zoo. You, you, you never know when some strange thing will, will happen or, 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 or you see a sharp shin hawk suddenly hunting or a merlin hunting right in front of you or, or you get a day of 800 birds and just coming out of the blue. Uh, it's, you, you never know. Every day is a tabula rasa. You start again. And it, I don't know why you do it. You go out and sit there all day from dawn till dark. But it's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it, it just gets you. And um, you continue doing it. Even if it's 25 below and it's your turn, you're out there. <laughs> now, curiosity. And that's the only reason I started studying the eagles. I said, this is interesting. And I think that's the only reason we should do anything, <laughs> is that we find it interesting. <laughs>